Did St. Augustine believe in a strong predestination view unto salvation, similar to the Reformers? Did he believe in sovereign grace, God's free will to be gracious, on whom he wills? Remember, St. Augustine is regarded as a doctor of the Roman Catholic Church. He's declared a saint, of course, by both them and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and so we should pay attention. He's a well-respected saint among those and Protestants as well. Calvin loved to quote him, and we'll see why exactly in a moment. So, allow me to present a case that the answer is yes to these questions. But please note, before you spam quotes at me or under the video, it seems Augustine may have had a softer, more foreknowledge view earlier on in his life, but he recanted, he changed his mind, he embraced a sovereign grace view later on. And so allow me to present a quick case. He wrote, It is therefore settled that God's grace is not given according to the deserts of the recipients, i.e., what a person deserves, but according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his own grace, so that he who glories may by no means glory in himself, but in the Lord who gives to those men to whom he will, because he is merciful. What if, however, he does not give, he is righteous, and he does not give to whom he will not, that he may make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy, Romans 9.23. For by giving to some what they do not deserve, he has certainly willed that his grace should be gratuitous, that is, free. And thus, genuine grace, by not giving to all, he has shown what all deserve, good in his goodness to some, righteous in the punishment of others, both good in respect of all, because it is good when that which is due is rendered, and righteous in respect of all, since that which is not due is given without wrong to any one. Here, Augustine plainly says that the salvation of a person is free and undeserved according to the good pleasure of God's will, to the praise and glory of his own grace and mercy, that no one is given injustice, but God's righteous punishment, when he withholds mercy, no one is wronged. God is not obligated to save anyone. We are not entitled. He's not, he's not forced to bring grace to everyone, as if everyone deserves the due reward uh, for their own righteousness. Everyone already deserves the due reward of their sins. Next, in his commentary on John 6, he wrote, what then did the Lord answer to such murmurers? Murmur not among yourselves, as if he said, I know why you are not hungry, and do not understand nor seek after this bread. Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come unto me except the Father that sent me draw him. Noble excellence of grace. No man comes unless drawn. There is whom he draws, and there is whom he draws not. Why he draws one, and draws not another. Do not desire to judge. If you desire not to, be, to err, accept it at once, and then understand. You are not yet drawn. Pray that you may be drawn. You must be drawn by God, or you won't be saved. And not everyone is drawn. If you are not drawn by God, pray for the grace to be drawn. He then goes on to explain that this drawing is not unwillingly or against your will, but with the affections of the heart. He says, the mind is drawn by love. You are drawn even by delight. Even by delight. It's a sweet drawing to Christ that God does. And in his commentary on John fifteen sixteen, where Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, he comments, Grace such as that is ineffable. For what were we, so long as Christ had not yet, cho yet chosen us, and we were therefore still destitute of love? For he who has chosen him, how can he love him? 
Were we, think you, in that condition which is sung of in the psalm, I had rather be an abject in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness? Surely not. What were we then but sinful and lost? We had not yet come to believe in him in order to lead to that choosing, to his choosing us. For if we were those who already believed that he chose, then was he chosen himself prior to his choosing. What? Uh, but how could he say, You have not chosen me, save only because his mercy anticipated us? Here surely is at fault the vain reasoning of those who defend the foreknowledge of God in opposition to his grace, and with this view declare that we were chosen before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, because God foreknew that we should be good but not that he himself would make us good. So says not he who declares you have not chosen me. For had he chosen us on the ground that he foreknew that we should be good, then would he also have foreknown that we should not be the first to make the choice of him. What was it then that he chose in those who were not good, for they were not chosen because of their goodness, inasmuch as they could not be good without being chosen. Otherwise grace is no more grace if we obtain the priority, or if we maintain the priority of merit. Such certainly is the election of grace, whereof the apostle says, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant saved according to the election of grace, to which he adds, and if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Listen, you ungrateful one, listen. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Not that you may say, I am chosen because I already believed. For if you were believing in him, then had you already chosen him. But listen, you have not chosen me. Not that you may say, before I believed, I was already doing good works, and therefore was I chosen. For what good work can be prior to faith? When the apostle says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14.23 What then are we to say on hearing such words, you have not chosen me, but that we were evil? and were chosen in order that we might be good through the grace of him who chooses who chose us for it is not for it is not by grace if merit proceeded but it is of grace and therefore that grace did not find but effected the merit so god enables us to be good by his grace and his grace alone we are not chosen because of our own faith, because of our own choice, because of our own merit or good works. But his choice comes first. His choice and his grace proceeds. And Augustine used merit, the word merit, in, a, in an old-fashioned way many centuries ago. He's writing in the early four, 400s, remember. Not in the sense of what Roman Catholics teach, or what uh, even what Protestants would assume the word merit means. But the word merit can have a more generic sense of work. So Augustine speaks of good merits and bad merits, and he says that we had only evil merits before we were saved by grace. And so he uses the word merit, merit in a, uh, a more generic or general sense to mean work. He even speaks of turning to God or loving God as merits. So... He's not talking about an inherent righteousness which uh, we stand upon for salvation. Finally, last example, which might be the strongest of all, uh, what I've found so far at least, I found this myself mainly. Um, it says, I think I have now discussed the point fully enough in opposition to those who vehemently oppose the grace of God, by which, however, the human will is not taken away, but changed from bad to good, and assisted when it is good. I think, too, that I have so discussed the subject that it is not so much I myself as the inspired scripture which has spoken to you in the clearest testimonies of truth. And if this divine record be looked into carefully, it shows us that not only men's 
good wills which God himself converts from bad ones, and when converted by him, directs to good actions and to eternal life, but also those which follow the world, are so entirely at the disposal of God, that he turns them wherever he wills and whenever he wills, to bestow kindness on some, and to heap punishment on others, as he himself judges right by a counsel most secret to himself, indeed, but beyond all doubt, most righteous. So he writes this passage near the end of his book on grace and free will, and this is available free online, and I bought it for about a dollar on Kindle, I definitely recommend it, I just finished it today, and he's very balanced, and he does teach that there is a voluntary will of man, we have a determination in and of ourselves to uh, refuse or to accept certain things, we are responsible to obey the law of God, we cannot plead ignorance, and at the same time he teaches a powerful sovereign grace of God, where we're all at the disposal of God, whether uh, to be good unto everlasting life, or evil as well, God turns them wherever he wills and whenever he wills. And he doesn't destroy the human will, though. We have a genuine free will. We have a genuine decision in his estimation. He uses that terminology of free will. I prefer not to use it myself, but our wills are free to decide. We, free, we are free to act according to our natures. And of course, the question is, does an unconverted person who is under the wrath of God who has no love and desire for Christ, who's not believing in Christ, do they ever have that ability in and of themselves in some sense to will what is good or to will faith and to exercise saving faith and saving interest in Christ without grace? The answer, according to Scripture, is a resounding no. And according to Augustine as well, God turns the will by his power and grace. We owe everything to God's grace from beginning to end and that is augustine's view god loves us first god chooses us first so that we may love him even love even faith are gifts of god according to saint augustine and so he is in agreement with luther and calvin on this issue of total depravity and unconditional election we cannot do any good apart from god's grace god enables us to do good god chooses us that we may be good that we may believe and this is clear in augustine's theology and I hope that was helpful. God bless.